to look at you sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, help us not give up because I really want to. We're so close. We're so close. Yeah. How are y'all? We're going. Okay. Brittany gives a thumbs up. Yay, Brittany. I kind of hit the wall this weekend. So, yeah. Uh, keep pushing each other or holding each other up or whatever it is we need to do because, man. So, we've got uh, Revelation 5 coming up. So, let's read through that first and then uh, remind me. I'll pull up the schedule because there's a couple things I want to make sure that I say out loud to remind us that they're coming up. But let's stand up and let's read the word together first. All right, so Revelation 4 and 5 are often referred to as the throne room, one of the th throne room scenes in Revelation. So you have kind of the first three chapters setting up what's happening. And then in 4 and 5, you, you see John gets this vision of what's happening around the throne. Chapter 4, the direction and the attention is focused primarily on God the Father. He's being praised as holy and the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. And then in Revelation 5, the, the attention shifts to the Lamb, to Jesus, and he's being praised as the Redeemer of all that is. And so this passage that we're memorizing is from Revelation 5, uh, and some of those songs that those gathered around the throne are singing. So let's read it. They took up a new song, saying, You are worthy to open the scroll. Sorry, it says take, doesn't it? So you know what that scroll thing's about, right? What? Do you know what the scroll's about? There's some mystery there. Okay, so at the very beginning of the book of, of, of chapter five, uh, there, we've got this scroll, and, and John weeps and weeps because he the, the angel has the scroll, and John weeps because there's nobody who's worthy to open it, except there is. Okay, so the angel says, "Hang on, look around." Here we go, and it's so cool because he says he uh, says the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. He is worthy to open the scroll, and then John says, "And I looked and I saw. What did he see?" A lamb. Yeah, so he's looking for this lion, like, you know, Aslan, and he sees a lamb who's been slaughtered, who's been murdered. And I love that um, juxtaposition of all of who Jesus is in that one little phrase. So all of that is leading us up to here, and I get excited about it. Okay, I'll try to read the words correctly this time. No promises. They took up a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And by your blood you purchased for God Persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will rule on the earth. Come on, don't do this to me. Then I looked, and I heard the sound of many angels surrounding the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. They numbered in the millions, thousands upon thousands. They said in a loud voice, worthy is the slaughtered lamb to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Notice there's seven there. That's on purpose. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. I heard everything everywhere say, blessing, honor, glory, and power belong to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and always. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So we've got list of seven. We also have some lists of four. Do you know what four is symbolic of in scripture? It, it relates back to north, south, east, and west. So totality, again. Not, not that kind of perfection like we see in the number seven, but, but the fullness. So you have it here, heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. North, south, east, and west. And you also have it, well, here, blessing, honor, glory, and power. There's another one, too. Tribe, language, people, nation. Okay. So that knowing that symbolism is a little bit of a mnemonic to help you remember what you're working with as you're doing the verse. Okay, let's read it one more time. And then Olivia, would you be willing to pray for us? Yeah. All right, let's do it. They took up a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And by your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will rule on earth. Then I looked, and I heard the sound of many angels surrounding the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. They numbered in the millions, thousands upon thousands. 
They said in a loud voice, worthy is the slaughtered lamb to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and might, and honor, glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, I heard everything everywhere say, blessing, honor, glory, and power belong to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and always. And the four living creatures said, amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's pray. Holy Father, God, you are so great. We are so worthy of praise. We thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. For we know that you are the one that provides power to the weak. So we come before you in our weakness and ask for you to give us just a little drop of the power that you have. Lord, see us right where we are. Hear our cries. Be with us in our celebrations. But I pray that when we look to your face, that all of our troubles around us will just fade away. God, we love you so much, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. So. Mm -hmm. All right, here's what we need to talk about. Yes, this is the right class. Good. Whew. Church visit two is due this Friday. Okay, shouldn't be hard to make that one happen because you've got a lot of online options. Okay, and those are all there. If you want to do something besides what's listed here or on the syllabus, just run it by me so we make sure it fits the uh, objectives for the assignment. Matthew, Rachel, and Lincoln are my leaders on Friday, so we will see um, how that will end up working. <laughs> we will figure something out one way or the other. Uh, we're doing table and dismissal. We've got an exam a week from Wednesday. All right. Um, Thanksgiving is almost here. So Revelation 5 will be in that exam. You've also got that option to have some handwritten notes with you. Uh, we'll do our last reading discussion, and there's no leaders on that day, so I get to be the leader. And I, we probably, well, this is a small group, so we'll, we'll see if there's even a group by that point. Um, so just keep keep trekking through that book. You're done with your journals, I hope. Okay. Uh, remember that if you want to do makeup on journals, if you want to do makeup on scripture memory stuff, those are wide open. If there's something else you'd like to propose to me on an individual basis, I will. Um, entertain those proposals. How's that? Okay. Um, we can negotiate. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. Any questions about that stuff? Yeah. I, I keep wanting to call you Rachel because Rachel sits right by you. And I don't know why that is. It's been like every day and it finally came out my mouth. It usually stops before it comes out my mouth. I'm sorry, Abby. Um, and just to be sure, on exam two, you can set, you said we can have a note card of any size. Any size. As long as it's handwritten by your own hand, then I don't care how big your paper is or how small you write. You may. <laughs> I'm good with that. Um, this is looking a little further ahead, so if you don't want to ask. It may be a segue to where I'm going. <laughs> so the week after Thanksgiving, we're working with our groups. Is there like a schedule for when we're presenting? So that's a great segue to where we're headed next. We're not going to do group projects. I give up. Okay. You're still going to do a project. Don't get too excited. Okay. You are still going to do a project. And let me show you what you're going to do. Um, right now, I only have one Google Doc on MCC Online, and you should just be able to view it, not edit it or anything. What I'm going to do is copy this for each of you and make your own Google Doc that will have your name attached to it. And then you'll go in and just put your work right in that Google Doc. Okay? So rather than the group project, because it just seems like it's – I was I, – I waited and waited and waited. I'm like, all right, we're doing all right. We're going to be able to – and, like, forget it. Okay? So you're going to do this portfolio instead. If you would like to work with someone else, you're welcome to do that. That's your choice. You can do that individually or in a two or three person group, a dyad or triad, whatever. If you choose to work together, everybody gets the same grade. Okay. So it's totally up to you. Simplicity would probably be to work on your own. But like if you're in quarantine, 
Brittany and Caitlin get together and crank this thing out while you're stuck, you know, I, because this, this really uh, should not be incredibly difficult. Let me zoom in a little. Sorry, that's hard to see. All right. So let me walk through it real quick. And like I said, you'll all have your own Google Doc that you can edit. If there's a problem technically with that, let me know and we can set up a different format for you. But that seems to be the, the most universal tech uh, format that people have access to right now. Okay, so you're going to do a lot of the same work that you would have done in the group project, but it won't be as heavy or as intense because you're not working together. You're working theoretically individually. You're going to listen to that same sermon, that same scripture, um, read some articles on prayer and offering and the Lord's Supper and invitations. And all you have to do is just go in and double click on that right there and tell me what percent you put you, you did of that. Okay. Then you're going to do... We're going to walk through aspects of the fourfold order. So for singing, you're going to find congregational appropriate songs that tell the gospel story. So this is going to take us back to our creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, the church, tell us. Um, so you got to have at least six songs. You can use more than six songs if you want to, but you got to have at least one for each of those. And there may be some overlap and you'll have space to explain that. And I just put a, a table here together for you so you don't forget the stuff that you need. So here, most likely you're going to start with creation unless you're going with some really creative backwards storytelling, which could happen. Um, you're going to give me the title, who wrote it. That's going to be in the copyright information, okay? Ren Collective is not a person, so don't tell me Ren Collective wrote it. Hillsong is not a person, okay? So find out who actually wrote it. Give me a link to the lyrics so that I can go just take a look at them and so I can try to read your mind that way basically a link to a recording and that could be a YouTube video you don't have to make the YouTube video like you're gonna have to in the group project this this can just be somewhere where I can hear it and read the lyrics okay and so that's two that could be the same link if it's a lyric video or if it's not whatever and then give me what do we say one to two sentences complete sentences subjects predicates adjectives all the stuff uh, tell me how that song tells it's part of the story Okay, so that's actually really kind of fun. I might not sound like it right now, but it's actually pretty fun. For the speaking part of the gathering, this time you are going to actually do a little video of yourself. You're going to uh, prepare a call to worship. You've got guidelines in your class notes. It can be original. You can pull it from scripture. You can borrow it from an outside source. But if you borrow it from an outside source, make sure you cite your source. So paste it right there in the doc. Uh, you can't steal any of the in-class examples because I get to to keep those. So you paste your work below, word for word, what your call to worship would be. Invocation, an original invocation. This time it can't be just pulled from scripture or just pulled from the internet or from a book or whatever. This time you've got to follow those guidelines that we had in class, write out an invocation, paste it right there. And then you're going to video yourself calling us to worship and invoking God's spirit to be in our worship service that we're not actually having. Okay. And then upload it to video to YouTube or whatever you prefer. Send me a link. You can make it unlisted if you're not comfortable with it being out there, but send me a link so I can watch you. Okay? Make sense? So with singing, no video required. Talking, yes, video required. For the word, yes, video, you're going to prepare a public scripture reading, at least 10 verses long. Use something other than just reading. Give the text. We're not looking for a sermon. We're just looking to let the word speak for itself. Video yourself, upload it, send me the link. Table. Um, the first thing you're going to do with table is pick a focus, all right? So when we talk about the Lord's Supper, we're focusing on Christ's death. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, hopefully in class. Matthew, wake up, man. Okay, your body language is lying then. <laughs> Lord's Supper, we focus on the death. Breaking of bread, we focus on the resurrected Christ. Communion, we focus on community, Eucharist, gratitude. Or we can also focus on looking back to the past, forward to what to what God has already done, and forward to what he is doing and will do. Inward to how he's working in our own lives. Outward to how he's working around us. So you pick one of those. You don't try to do all five of those. Everybody good on that? Just pick one. Once you've and then highlight it so I know which one you picked again, so I don't have to try to read your mind. Then you're going to plan a table service with scripture reading, with a written meditation, with a prayer, 
and then how you'll communicate to your congregation what's going to happen for communion. Okay, write all of that out, paste it, including your scripture. All right, paste everything right here, and then video yourself doing that talk. You don't have to try to put together you know the elements and try to serve it and that kind of thing because. Who knows who, if anybody, you'll be able to be with at that point. But video yourself doing that talk. And then baptism. Pick one, mark it, write it out. Uh, no video for baptism. And then dismissal, a benediction, and sending. We'll talk about that uh, next week, hopefully, Lord willing. Uh, and then video that. And so once you have all those videos, you don't have to make one big long video. They can just be short ones. That way you can clip them together. You don't have to try to edit it and make it fancy. Okay, so everybody that's here anyway, okay with that or clear on what we're doing there? What, what questions do you have about it? Haley. Um, so if you were to work together, um, how would you like that in the videos? Uh, if you work together... <laughs> I'll leave that flexible. Um, it needs to be clear that you didn't just go, okay, you do this one and you, I'll do this one and you do this one and I'll do this one. It, there needs to be somebody that you can physically be in the same room with and collaborate with. So is that fair? I'm trying to leave some wiggle room since we didn't get to do an actual group project. But I've never done these as group projects before either. So I'll, there'll be some flexibility. We take like each individual clip and just make it one big video and upload it so we don't have to like do a bunch of different links. Yes, that's fine. So if you do that, just make a note somewhere in the doc so that I don't start thinking you forgot to to put the video or just keep pasting the same, just put the same link every time if you want. That's okay too. Yeah, whatever, whatever is easiest for you. Whichever, because I'm, it's not a video production class, so I'm not concerned about your video production abilities. Um, so if editing all that is more of a hassle, then do separate clips. If separate clips is more of a hassle, do one great big one. I'm good with that. Good question. All right, any other questions on that? If we have some of it done early, can we like show you as kind of just like, Hey, you know, is this what I need to be doing? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Any any of those, you're welcome to run by me, like for a rough draft kind of thing. I'd be glad to take a look at them. Same thing, too, with your third step of your biblical theology of worship. Uh, that's coming up. What is that? That one's right after Thanksgiving. Do that before Thanksgiving, y'all. I'll give you, I, yeah, if I give you bonus points, will you do it before Thanksgiving? <sighs> It could be candy, maybe. I don't, uh, don't, don't, don't leave that hanging over here. What'd you say, Brittany? Bonus point. <laughs> Bonus point. Uh, well, whenever it is that you do it, if you want some feedback, that will, you know, as you get started, if you want to send me just a small portion of it to make sure you're on the right track, I'd be glad to give you feedback beforehand. Okay. Any other questions about that stuff? <laughs> So that's going to be due at the day and time of the final. And I will still reserve this last week of class for project work, even though it might not be a group project. So we won't have new material. We won't have lecture, that kind of stuff. We, you can come in here if you're able to come in here. I'll be available to answer questions. Uh, I probably won't take role that week, though, if you hear what I'm not saying. Okay. But if I give you a whole week to work on it and you give me stinky stuff, I will give you a stinky grade. So, <laughs> Carson. What is the final exam going to look like? That's it right there. Yep. Yeah, the only other exam we have in here is this exam, too. So there is no cumulative exam. The project is your cumulative exam. Great question. Okay. We are in the home stretch. All right. As you keep working on it, keep feeding questions my way as if you need to, okay? So let's talk about the Lord's Supper. Let's talk about the table. Um, hang on, let me see if this is somebody trying to get to class. Nope, just a JCPenney coupon. No worries. Oh, yay. Hello, Elise. Oh, okay. <laughs> let's just mark them here real quick. Should I make them tardy? 
<laughs> Elise is here and Caitlin's here. Awesome. Tell them to watch the video so they know about the assignment. Well, that's going to bug me. All right, let's talk about the table. Find a friend and be six uh, feet apart from them. But when we talk about the table, when we talk about the Lord's Supper. Remember, Aristotle's fish, we need to examine the water we're swimming in. We need to think about uh, what presuppositions we bring with us, what unwritten rules we bring with us when we start to talk about coming around the table. So take a couple minutes and talk about those. And I also want to have you reflect on how your time at MCC has or hasn't impacted your understanding of the Lord's Supper from when you got first got here. Okay? Come on, Matthew. Yeah. So we're supposed to talk about presuppositions, unwritten rules, and then how has our time at MCC impacted our understanding of the Lord's Supper? Something I can go um, Honestly, like this class and like just talking about like when we went to the mass, obviously I don't believe in like the transubstantiation thing. But it has really impacted the way that I think about the word supper, like how big of a deal it is and how we don't spend like any time on it in in church and how it has been desire to do that because it is such a big deal. So I feel like that is one thing of the NCC that has impacted the way I view the word supper. Over it and, take it. and I didn't know that was an unwritten rule, so I just 
Listen to this. This is good. And everyone was like stared at me. But so that was an unwritten rule that I didn't know. And then felt like yeah, I did it. Isn't that awful when we when we do that to people like when that happens to you? Like yeah. I have a friend who so I am just gonna interrupt you and use that as a transition. I have a friend who was visiting Crestview years ago. Um, because I know they don't have this kind of community anymore because I go to church there now and I didn't back then. But they had these wafers that were about this big. And he it was his first time there and he must have been late or something and ended up in the front. And so he's like, Okay. So he grabs the whole wafer, pops the thing in his mouth. Apparently that was not the right thing to do. So he was getting like death stares from people because he was supposed to break off from the wafer. And uh, we we alienate people when we don't communicate our unwritten rules to them. So um, what are the chances? Oh, this is so good. Then we'll, then we'll cross our fingers and see if the video will work. Uh, this is an invitation to the table that I, I just stumbled on uh, years ago and have found I just, it's gorgeous. Uh, so come to the table. You who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been to the sacrament often and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed come. And it's Christ who invites us to meet him here. This is his table, his invitation. In one sense, we're some of the most connected people to have ever walked the face of the earth. We're all just a call, a click, or a text message away from each other. But in another sense, we are some of the most disconnected people to have ever lived. And over the last few centuries, even our Christian faith has tended toward a more privatized and more individualized expression of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We focus on a personal relationship with Jesus, on a quiet time alone with God, and on a faith that's worked out in the solitude of our own minds. And when we focus only on these things, we find ourselves very alone, very isolated, and very much without the love and wholeness that Scripture describes as a life connected with God. Tables have been used for lots of different things throughout history, but one of their most common uses that is a place. It's a place to bring uh, people together around ideas, around events, or around identity. The family dining room table is a place where the young and old, the esteemed and the estranged, winners and losers, all get together to share a meal that binds them together into brother, sister, mother, father, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents. It's a place where they find their belonging through identity. Absolutely necessary to our identity as humans. The Lord's table calls and binds us together as God's family. God takes the broken, the lost, the alone, the marginalized, and He brings us all together and gives us a place to belong based simply on our family name, the name of Christian. We no longer die alone. We're brothers and sisters that have been adopted together by the same Father were restored by the same brother and friend, Jesus Christ. We're fused and formed together in his death and resurrection. He's given us a family name and a family bond that no one can take away. It's being sustained by the very creator of the universe himself. The church, like any family, isn't perfect, but it's God's family. And it has the potential to make us into the sons and daughters brothers and sisters that God longs for us to be.
I think one of the hardest um, unwritten rules or presuppositions that we have to fight, but also one of the most important ones that we have to fight, is this way that we forget that communion is communal. We have embraced it as a very personal, individual time. Um, I had an elder angry, I mean, got his finger in my face and he cried and so he won because when an old farmer cries, he's going to win. When a woman cries, you're going to lose. It's not fair. That's a different class. Uh, but he got his finger in my face and said, this is my time with my Jesus who died for my sins. We had changed some things and I thought slowly and carefully and pastorally, we'd started singing during communion to try to help emphasize this is community. This is a community. It, it did not it was it was so hard for him to even grasp that it was anything other than his time with his Jesus who died for his sins. And but I think that that unwritten rule that we've grasped that it's my time with my Jesus who died for my sins, we've got to break that and we've got to get past it because I think it's one of the most important ways that we can see how beautiful this invitation to the table really is. Let's look at some key passages. First Corinthians 11. Paul writes, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Ouch. Okay. I think there are probably times Paul could say those same exact words to us, and we need to watch out and be on our guard for that. Your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person gets remains hungry and another one gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Do y'all know what the Greek right there for that certainly not is? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> that, that's, that's the southern southern Greek, yes. Yeah, it's, it's the Greek phrase is meganoita. And there's actually a paraphrase of scripture that translates it, hell no, which I think is probably one of the best ones that, that we could to, to get the fierceness and the seriousness of what he's trying to say. And he's, it's, it's got a little shock value on purpose. Shall I praise you for acting this way? Hell no. Or how'd you say that? That was much more. I said, oh, hell no. That's not, I like that. I, I don't know if I can pull it off. So I'll just point to you when we get to make a noise up. <laughs> so, so we go from this mess, right? People stuffing themselves, getting drunk at the table, ignoring those who are poor. And then we turn to uh, what a, a passage of scripture that are known as the, the words of institution. Uh, just kidding. We didn't get there yet. There it is. I skipped. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Then he goes on. So, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism for dying. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we wouldn't come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we won't finally be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so when you meet together, it won't result in judgment. And when I come, I'll give further directions. Let's look back at that. 
Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Pretty serious. Okay, pretty harsh uh, warning. Something we need to pay attention to. And so what's the solution? Examine ourselves before we eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Because if we eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. Right now, the church environment where I grew up in took this very seriously. And that's how we got, long story short, because of this, that's how we got to my time with my Jesus who died for my sins. Because I had to be sure and examine myself before I eat of the bread and drink of the cup so that I would make sure that I don't eat and drink without discerning the body. And so what I was taught both in word and in um, watching other people's practice was that I needed to confess all my sins in the time in between when they started serving and when it got when the trays got to me. Okay, which is if you're in the front row, kind of scary because you had to confess really fast, right? But for whatever reason, that was that was kind of how we acted. And that somehow I can remember as a kid just thinking, you know, it's like I felt like I could feel the forgiveness going down to my it's going down my esophagus with the juice, right? Um, I was supposed to examine myself in that moment and to make sure I discerned the body of Christ, I was supposed to sit there and focus on Jesus' physical body hanging on that cross, and it was my sins who did that. And there was nothing else I was supposed to think about. I wasn't supposed to make eye contact with anybody. I wasn't supposed to talk or ask somebody for a piece of gum or even cough. It was my time to confess and think about what a terrible person I was because Jesus was on that cross for me, okay? Now, there's a time and place even for that, right? And uh, one of the things that I think is so beautiful about our liturgical brothers and sisters churches is that practice of corporate confession. It doesn't have to be tied to the 12 seconds before the trays get to you or the 90 seconds before the trays get to you. That examination needs to be an ongoing thing, not a, a just real quick once a Sunday kind of moment. And then um, a moment that was just really uh, somewhat earth shaking for me and my understanding of the Lord's Supper was actually when my dad came and did a communion meditation at the church where I was serving. And he talked about this passage but he turned it on its head. And I don't know why I had never heard him say that before because I was his kid and I've heard him preach a whole lot of times. But he turned it on his head and said, let's look at how Paul uses the word body. So let's do that. Is the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation? And is it, is it not a participation in the blood? Is the bread that we break not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. What's the body there? How's Paul using the word body here? The church. the church. First Corinthians, the body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and though its parts are many, they are formed, they form one body, so it is with Christ. How's he using the word body here? The church. Uh and, and there, there are multiple other examples. Does that mean for sure that that's exactly how he's using the word body earlier? We got to decide. We got to do some interpretation. Maybe he's playing with it. Maybe he's telling us that we need to think about Jesus' physical body and the body gathered around us. And especially if we're going to one extreme or the other, we've got to be sure that when we discern the body, we're recognizing that we are with the body, that we are the body gathered together around the table of the Lord. Will Willimon says to discern the body means to see one's brothers and sisters around the table as the visible presence of the risen Christ. If we're going to do that, we got to open our eyes. If we're going to do that, we've got to look around. We've got to see each other, first of all, but not just see each other, but to see each other as the visible presence of the risen Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, <laughs> helping me hold on to that hope of glory because I see his life and his work real in who you are. 
not just in my own imagination, not just in my own mind. And so after my dad did that communion meditation, one of our uh, 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 worship team members kind of piggybacked onto it. I think the next week, it may have been a couple weeks later. And he invited us to what he calls open-eyed communion. And it messed with our heads. Try it sometime. Try keeping your eyes open throughout the next time that you're in communion with other people. Maybe even make eye contact with somebody. It's awkward. It's worth it, though. Thank God for the individuals that you see around you that make up the body of Christ and that represent the visible presence of the risen Christ around that table. There's so much more going on than just me and Jesus. So much more going on than just me and my sins. Henry Nowen, you guys know that name? I know we've quoted him in here. Read him. He's good. So when we gather around the table and break the bread together, we are transformed. Not only individually. The individual happens, right? We can't separate ourselves from ourselves. But also as community. We, people from different ages and races with different backgrounds and histories, become one body. As Paul says, as there is one loaf, so we, although there are many of us, are one single body. For we all share in the one loaf. Not only as individuals, but also as community, we become the living Christ. Taken, blessed, broken, and given to the world. As one body, we become a living witness of God's immense desire to bring all peoples and nations together as the one family of God. You hear the echoes of what uh, the words of institution the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. Took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it. You hear that pattern, okay? Oh, another key passage. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get through it. Okay, so we've got the, our, our, our first passages that we go to are going to be um, the Last Supper accounts, okay? And we didn't, we, we didn't even read those today. But the Last Supper accounts are going to be uh, what instituted this thing we call the Lord's Supper, all right? There was only one Last Supper. The Lord's Supper is ongoing. Um, what is the Last Supper? Where is its roots? If we want to go back even further. Passover, okay? So take it even further back. We have a tendency, though, to kind of stop there. Um, and so another kind of mind-shattering, um, earth-shattering, whatever, mind-blowing uh, aspect for me in trying to understand more about what happens at the table was finding out that Luke 24 is also a communion passage. Luke 24 says, now that same day, okay, stop for a second, which same day would that be? Put on your New Testament hats. Luke 24, we're getting towards the end because we know the Gospels only have so many chapters. Say it again. Yes, this is Sunday of resurrection. Yeah, this is resurrection day. So now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Get behind that. Uh, I'm terrible with distances. Somebody tell me what's seven miles from here. Ogden? Oh. Like you said, Brittany? Right <laughs> How would the church be seven miles from here? There are a lot of them. Which church? I didn't. A church. Okay, well, let's just. Well, it, it, it's less far than you think. I'm yeah. Walk, but... Okay. Let's go to Zenedale. How's that? Okay. Or at least to that park that's on the way to Zenedale. You know, that it's a really cool park, Fairmont Park. You should go there sometime. Okay, so let's walk there. Why walk? Because that's how they were going to do it. Okay, maybe ride a horse or a donkey, but most likely they're walking, right? In fact, I think it says they were walking. All right, so two of them are going. So about seven miles. Oh, let's pick something we all actually know. Haley, where's someplace? Annenberg. Let's just go to Annenberg. We all know how to get to Annenberg from here, right? All right, let's walk to Annenberg. Totally not seven miles from here to Annenberg but close enough, okay? Uh, they're talking with each other about everything that had happened. What had happened? Jesus was crucified. Yeah, okay. 
They thought he was the Messiah. All right? Remember, creation, fall, Israel. One of the things that characterizes Israel is waiting for the Messiah. They waited and waited. They looked and they hoped. They thought they'd finally found him. Okay? And they just saw him get tortured to death. Literally. They must be utterly exhausted in every possible way. Okay? Get behind that. Real people walking down a real road. They talked and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you talking about? So they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, essentially, you're not from around here, are you? Okay. You're only a visitor to Jerusalem? Do you not know what's been going on? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Cleopas and his companion, possibly his wife, maybe just another disciple. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all that happened. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels. You said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. But him, they didn't see. And he's just almost here like, oh, we don't know what to do with all this. So we're going home. <laughs> we're tired. He said, you idiots. How foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And so beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So they approached the village to which they were going. Jesus acted like he was going to go on further. Good Jewish social cues. Being the good Jewish hosts and hostess they were, they urged him strongly, stay with us. It's, it's almost night. The day's almost over. Come on. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. Now, get behind that, too. They've been out of town. Can't just run to Walmart, buy some groceries, okay? Don't have a fridge to keep the leftovers in from however long they've been gone, okay? So they take the time to prepare a meal, prepare a place for him. So when he was at the table, he took bread, blessed it, he gave things for it, he broke it, and began to give it to them. That's when their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and then he disappeared. Can't wait to find out how all that worked someday. They asked each other, were in our hearts burning within us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. So they got up and returned at once from Annenberg to MCC. How far? Seven miles, seven more miles that same day, right? They found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So they told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And so... For centuries now, when believers talk about coming together to break the bread, that's what they're pointing back to, even if they don't realize it. But we got to quit for today, so we'll talk more about that on Wednesday. Go in peace. Let them serve the risen Lord. Bye, Brittany and Caitlin. And Elise.